Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We're so glad you could join us. And today we're going to be talking all about manual propulsion, basically how to make these wheelchairs uh, push effectively, efficiently, and make sure that we're um, keeping people healthy and sound um, for the time that they're using these wheelchairs. Uh, just in case you haven't met me before, I'm Amy Bjornson. I'm the clinical director here at Sunrise Medical, um, broadcasting from our new Weatherall Park um, Center and um, assessment center as well. So we'll get right into it. When we're, when we're looking at these self-propelling, what we call active wheelchairs, it's, it's really about creating the the posture, the stability, the comfort, the ability to, to sit in this chair for 10, 12, maybe even 16 hours per day. We wanna make sure that these clients can do the things that they did perhaps before they needed a wheelchair or just as their life develops, make sure that we're maximizing their potential. Um, and we want to do it as, in a, as efficiently as possible, just so that we're um, really reducing the amount of overuse injuries that might happen as they get older or spend more time in a wheelchair. What we're really striving for is, is creation of a lifestyle to get out there and do the things that their able-bodied counterparts would do. We're maximizing their potential. Um, this is a friend of mine. We had the really great opportunity of going to Vietnam. This is taken at a uh, rehab center in Ho Chi Minh City. And um, he was um, doing some wheelchair tricks up on top of a ramp and showing these guys what was possible. But we both knew in our heads that it was possible because he was in a wheelchair that was prescribed for him, right? Gave him the ability to, to gain the skills, really. So if, if our clients don't get this opportunity, if they're not fitted with a proper wheelchair, um, personalized for them, measured, configured for them, basically they start to compensate. They create different sitting strategies. You can see he's really posteriorly rotated. Um, he's got a rounded trunk because we haven't offered him support in this wheelchair. That compensation then turns into compromise, compromised, posture, in terms of skin integrity, in, in terms of lung volumes, in terms of ability to push that chair. There's no way to create an ergonomic push stroke when his posture over the top of it is this poor. That's going to lead to postural instabilities and muscle imbalances from anterior to posterior. It'll probably put him at high, high risk for a biceps tendonitis and supraspinatus tendonitis rotator cuff issues, that's going to get worse the longer he spends time pushing that way. His skills, there's no way this kid's going to be able to do a wheelie in that position to manage his own curbs or inclines, declines, and really what that's doing is taking away his potential to, to get out there and experience life. Okay, so this is what we really want to avoid, you know, just people having to compromise and make, um, you know, compensate for a piece of equipment that doesn't work for them. There's lots of evidence, there's lots of work that's been done in this, in this area about how people should sit, how people should push. Um, some of my favorite resources are the Consortium of Spinal Cord Medicine. This is aging a little bit here, 2005. ResNi, which is the rehabilitation um, industry, in the United States. Um, they put out lots of position papers in 2012. They did the application of ultralight manual wheelchairs. And then um, lots of the, uh, industry groups have done uh, looks on the biomechanics of, of, of pushing. So basically when you drill all those down, when you condense them, what they all say is that you want to provide um, a posture that that really include minimizing the amount of times that you hit that wheel, so that's your stroke frequency. You wanna minimize the force with which that, um, that movement is applied, so hit the hand rim with less force. And we also want to avoid extremes of ranges of motion, of uh, your shoulder joint, your elbow, even your wrist, okay? Or potentially injurious positions of those joints. So that's what we're trying to create within how we're configuring these manual wheelchairs. So they're gonna be pushed with upper extremities full time. And if, again, if I just drill that down just a little bit further, we know that what that means is that we're gonna support 
an appropriate ergonomic posture. And we want to decrease the force put through those hand rims to the wheels and hit the hand rim the fewest amounts of times possible for a given distance. All of, we're going to be able to hit these main goals by a well-built, lightweight wheelchair with tight tolerances. But just as important as all that is how it's configured to suit the user so that we're matching that wheelchair frame and its components to how the person sits and pushes on top of it, really. Just a little bit of an anatomy background. Um, remember that uh, you know our shoulder is really built for mobility. It's not meant to be a weight-bearing, strong sort of joint. Okay, um, the humeral head has um, three times uh, sort of the movement, the curvature of of that, um, how the socket works is much more open when we compare it to the hip joint. So as a, a cause or as a result of that, we're gonna rely on the ligaments and the tendons here to keep that shoulder joint integrity, okay? It's really gonna be the ligaments and those muscle um, tendons that allow for the good biomechanics and the integrity of that shoulder joint. When we're looking at how a, a manual wheelchair gets pushed, know that the arm is held in about 70, depending a little bit on the person, but um, generally um, the arm is held in about 70 degrees of abduction. And initially that shoulder is extended and internally rotated, which if you've um, thought about anatomy for a while, that's putting that shoulder in a really um, strong impingement position. Okay, because that supraspinatus going through the tunnel, the biceps um, tendon coming through, just puts it in, in harm's way, if you will. Okay. And then towards, if we, if we push through and then that recovery phase of, of uh, the cycle, you're going to be more in flexion of the shoulder and external rotation. All of that leads to a more developed flexor group of muscles. They're going to get um, stronger and probably a little bit tighter. Whereas, um, and you're also your internal rotators, because again, that's your anterior group of muscles. But what it's going to do to your posterior muscles, your external rotators, your extenders, even your um, scapular musculature that's attaching it to the chest wall, those are all on the weaker side and they're a little bit more lengthened, more stretched. So, you know, creating instability, um, not equal uh, participation of all those different muscle groups. Okay. And then when you also take into consideration that some of um, our spinal cord injured patients will have the majority of their anterior muscles innervated, where some of their posterior, their rotator cuff muscles, um, might not still be innervated based on their spinal cord injury. Okay, Just creating or um, further enhancing that muscle inequality from front to back. What that's going to lead to is a more rounded posture, more forward um, humeral head position. And then when you have that, you have more impingement, more bursitis um, issues, microtraumas, um, ligamentous tendon issues. Okay, All of this is very, very well studied. We know this, but now our role here in prescribers is, hey, how do we minimize this risk um, and how do we set somebody up for success, really? I won't go into the therapeutic um, you know, muscle strengthening aspect of it, but realize that that's important as well. Take homes, realize that that um, anterior versus posterior muscle group is important uh, and the rotator cuff needs to be considered not only for posture, but also for conditioning. We need to think about those push phase muscles. Those are the ones that give us the trouble. And if we can um, make the co-contraction happen better, we'll be less at risk for these overuse injuries. Not only is that gonna be a, a muscle training activity, therapeutic exercise, but we can also um, enhance it by the posture that we provide over the top of this wheelchair. So if we just make sure that we're all on the same page about what we mean by push phase versus recovery phase. So the green line is gonna be your push 
And this is a really nice example of sort of that 10 to two on the clock face, or even, you know, sort of 9.30 to 2.30 face. We want to have access to the majority of that hand rim for a nice push, a good push stroke, and then also a nice recovery phase. We'll look at some diagrams here in a second, but we want this um, propulsion stroke to look like a nice semicircle where the top of the semicircle is equal in length to the bottom semicircle. Okay. This is only going to happen when we have the person positioned well on top of that wheel. Talk about that in just a second. But um, in order for this to happen in this push phase, equal in the recovery phase, that's what we want it to look like. Okay. And we know that based on the evidence I talked about previously, the fewer time we hit that hand rim, the better off we are. The, hard, uh, the least amount of force that we push it with that we add to that, um, the better off the client is. Okay. So that's what we're trying to create. And a lot of that has to do obviously with the posture of the client, making sure that the biomechanics, the integrity of that shoulder joint is good, and that we're sitting in a position over the wheel where we have access to create that sort of push cycle. When we do this well, we know that there is a better direct transfer of energy. The work of pushing goes into the work of moving that chair, okay? The more direct transfer we can have, the better off. The faster they'll be able to go, the further distance they'll be able to go, the more efficiently, the um, fewer overuse injuries we'll have. So probably key tenant in all of this is what I call hosapawa. And that means that the client's head is over their shoulder, is over their pelvis, which is over the center of the wheel. So you have a nice plumb line and the body is in its normal curves with as normal a pelvis, neutral pelvis as you can get, normal spinal alignment, shoulders on top of that, head on top of that, okay? We can also use a really nice measuring tool and that's the tip of the client's middle finger hitting the center of the wheel. Okay. That allows them that when they put their hand onto the hand rim, they're gonna have about 120 degree um, flexion at the elbow. They'll have a neutral position at the shoulder and they'll have a neutral position at the wrist, not too much extension, not too much flexion. And, as you'll see, or we saw in a previous slide, that'll allow them to have that 9.30 on the clock face to about 2.30, that semicircle on the top, and then the semicircle recovery phase at the bottom. In terms of the efficiency of the chair, it also sets us up well because I have the majority of the weight over the drive wheels. So in order for this thing to be efficient moving with friction across surfaces, I want to have the majority of the weight of the system over the, the what I call the drive wheels, here the rear wheels, 70 to 80% on this. I want to minimize the amount of weight that's on the caster, 20 to 30% tops, because casters will sink into an uneven surface. They're drag, they have resistance. So the least weight I have on them, the better off this thing will drive. Okay. It'll also allow them to do um, little wheelies, get over door thresholds, uneven surfaces easier, the less weight they have over those casters. Okay. Head over shoulders, over the pelvis, over the wheels, axles. And the majority of these active wheelchairs will have a center of gravity adjustment because you might add an extra backrest because people might be different shapes, because someone might have a heavier torso than a lower extremity. So we need to um, be able to, to really personalize where that COG is. So it's a nice mix of stable enough, excuse me, stable enough and also pushable enough, maneuverable enough. Okay. We measure this distance based on the front of the back canes to the center of the wheel. And then we measure that distance. The bigger the number therefore, the further forward the wheel is gonna be, the tippier the wheelchair will be, it's on its 
sort of consideration end. But also the more push friendly it is, more maneuverable it is, the more it's able to get into a little wheelie for getting over those door thresholds, things like that, okay? Versus if I have a smaller number, the wheel is gonna be push, um, maneuvered back further. It'll be more stable, but it'll also be just a little bit harder to push, okay? We're gonna, the center of gravity needs, you need to take into consideration the overall center of gravity, sort of center of mass of your client, what their wheelchair skills are, um, also what type of chair it is. But most of these chairs will have some sort of adjustment um, that you can move it after time of order. Remember that the more forward you put that wheel means that there's gonna be um, less inertia. So more um, push will get actually triggered into moving the chair. You're gonna, because it moves better, you're gonna need fewer strokes for a given distance. You also will have more access to that push rim so that you can have that 9.30 to 2.30 sort of access. It'll be quicker to accelerate. Overall, this type of system with a COG is more forward will be easier to push as long as it has its um, needed amount of stability. Okay. You might also wanna consider um, transfers. The further forward that wheel is, if somebody's doing a side transfer, you may need to take that into account. Can they do a safe transfer across without hitting their bum on the wheel? All right. Next thing that we need to consider in terms of um, how to configure these wheelchairs is the both the front and the rear seat height. Okay. The difference there is going to give them sort of active control of gravity. We bucket their seat, we give them a seat slope, so they don't have to use so many muscles to stay upright in a good posture. It also stops the person from sliding forward. Okay? If we have a 90 degree back seat to back angle here, and the only thing that we change is that the rear seat height is less than the front, we're gonna call that dump. Okay? Or some people call it rake or seat slope. I like to see at least an inch of dump in these systems. That means that my front seat height is going to be one inch higher than my rear. For somebody that's a little bit more sporty, a little bit more active, or for somebody that might be um, a little bit, have a little bit less trunk control, you might also use more dump to give them control of their pelvis, better trunk control something more like an inch and a half or even two inches. Okay. Do be aware that when you're selecting your front seat height, you do have to be considerate of their legs so that they can fit their legs there and they also have enough ground clearance. Okay. But one of the key tenets to um, allowing uh, people to sit better with better postural support and also give them better access to a good push. Um, again, we measure a rear seat height and a front seat height. This one isn't marked on my picture here. The difference between them will be dump. And then if I also take my seat to back angle and I decrease it, if I squeeze them together, we're gonna call that system squeezed. So we dump it first and then we squeeze it. And squeeze just means that I'm reducing that seat to back angle, sort of bucketing the person uh, even more into the system, okay? This will allow people to sit even better, um, get them more centered over those drive wheels. Um, just make sure that you know transfers are considered hip flexor length is considered. Okay, and that's what I mean by that seat to back angle. Um, and do be aware that not all of our active chairs, not all of our um, rigid or folding chairs have that seat to back angle adjustability. So if that's important to you, make sure that you ask, hey, is there squeeze available in this wheelchair? Here is a picture of uh, Quickie 2 here, which does not, this particular chair does not have seat to back angle adjustability. You'd be able to do a little bit if you added a J3 back. You could tighten more the back angle versus the seat to back. 
but just be aware if you want to create some squeeze, make sure that your chair has that availability. If you have a rigid chair, that will either have sort of a lanyard or a bar where you can change that angle, or some of them may actually have tool adjustment seat to back angle. If we look at the push strokes, and again, there's been lots of um, data, lots of research done on this. Um, Boninger is a researcher out of the US. He's done lots and lots of work about the biomechanics of pushing and efficiencies. Basically, his work in the early days were, were looking at how people pushed, and they came up with um, basic four types. And we'll start worst and then go to the best here. The arc, I call this a granny push. Basically, this happens when somebody is sitting really in front of the wheel. The wheel is a long way behind them. It happens a lot in standard chairs or chairs that are set up where they're just too stable for the end user. And they can't reach very much of that rear wheel, so they end up with really short sort of staccato pushes, breaking all those tenants that we talked about before. I want to hit the wheel the fewest amount of times with the least amount of force possible. Uh, these granny or these arc pushes are all about fast, rapid, and hard, super inefficient. And you can imagine, you know, where their joints are going to be. They're going to be at the, the sort of the extended, um, the extremes of ranges of motion, putting all those muscles and tendons and ligaments in harm's way. And then they looked at, um, I'll go to single loop first here. They looked at this one. We got a little bit more access to the wheel. Still not, you know, 9.30 to 2.30, but better. But then the person here, they pick up their arm, lifting it to return to the push phase, okay? They're using a lot of energy to pick that arm back up, and they're also getting into the extremes of that shoulder joint range. We want to avoid that extra energy expenditure, and we want to avoid that range of motion. And so we don't like that one either. And then here's a double loop. This one's pretty good, where we're getting um, a really nice push stroke, and then we're getting that nice relaxed under, um, under the hand rim, passive relaxation. But then they're sort of picking up their wrist and doing some work there. So energy expenditure that we don't need. Okay. What we want to promote and facilitate and train, all three of those things need to be done, is our semicircular. Okay, that was that first set of slides I showed where we got a push phase that equals the recovery phase. So really good access to the wheel, 9.30 to 2.30, and then we have this whole rest phase where there's not any muscle expenditure happening, no energy expenditure. It's avoiding any um, extremes of ranges of motion. You know, the wheelchair is moving forward, so momentum is gonna bring their hand back to the starting position, and push. So a push, a rest, a push, a rest. Okay. That is really what we are promoting. We have to have that hasapua posture over the top of it so that it can be facilitated. And then that last step is we got to train people that that's really that they how they need to push. It's hard to remember that whole relaxation phase. All right, one more person just to show that hasapawa and really what we're trying to create. Head over the shoulders, over the pelvis, over the center of the wheel. And again, a nice marking tool to use is the tip of their middle finger to the center of that wheel. So that when they put their hand on the hand rim, 9.30 to 2.30, sort of push phase and good ergonomic position of those upper extremity joints. We'll talk a little bit about camber and lateral access too, um, but that width um, lateral access also needs to be considered. Okay. And our goal really is to have that wheel as far forward as possible so that we can have that hasapua, but we can't compromise the stability, backward stability or even frontward stability with a width that's appropriate to that end user so that we can keep, um, you know, that, that uh, position laterally of the shoulder joints and elbow joints as well. 
and this is where it gets a little bit into the tricky we need to have it be stable enough so that the client can um, do all the functional things that they need to do in the chair whether you know backwards tippy or frontwards stable uh, a lot of times if you lose something on the on the floor you want to be able to reach down pick that up without feeling that the chair is going to be too forward stippy um, remember that we can alter some of that tippiness, not only on the rear wheel position, but also on um, changing your cushion height, changing the seat to back angle of the wheelchair, um, changing foot plate and therefore foot position, either for aft or in height. And then the, these rear axle positions and orientation space front and rear seat height, that's what we've talked about. All of those things are going to have an impact on the stability and the maneuverability of the wheelchair. And when we don't do it well, it's dramatic. Um, this is a poor girl where almost everything has been done to make pushing harder. Okay. She drops her hands down, she's nowhere near the center of that wheel. She's stuck with little granny pushes right at the top because she's sitting way too high in that wheelchair, way too high, and the wheels are significantly behind her. We drop that plumb line. And then we've given her the heaviest wheels and the least absorptive wheels. These are really um, old style mags. Okay. And then if we look at her poor little casters, she's got a tiny casters and narrow ones, so they're going to get stuck in everything. They won't make it over the softer carpet where she is. She's going to have trouble with door thresholds. And then this is the fork here. Anytime she turns, that whole caster swing is going to be ginormous. Okay? So we've just set her up for a lot of troubles, a lot of failure. What I would do to fix it, is I would drop her wheels in this frame so that she sits lower in the back. It's also going to give her um, some dump. Okay. I would also move the wheels forward on the frame so that it can create that hasapawa. Next thing I would do is probably give her a bigger size caster and a shorter fork just so that it doesn't take as much energy to turn. And remember that your caster and your fork are going to create some different seat to floor heights. Good rule of thumb is the caster size that's appropriate to the environment. Remember, it's not only about diameter, but now we make thicker ones so we can have smaller casters but thicker so they do better on multiple terrains. So the caster that's required for the train and as short a fork as possible to give you your seat to floor height that's required. Okay. So she's really set up for what I call a dump truck. She ain't gonna push this very, very far, very fast. And then this is a friend of mine who grew up in a wheelchair, had spina bifida from birth. Look at how tight his chair is to him, okay. He's sitting right over that wheel. He's got 95% of the weight over his drive wheels. Very, very little here. So this is gonna be way on the tippy side of the scale, okay? especially when he adds his backpack. But, you know, he's grown up in a wheelchair. He's got the skills, he can manage that. If not, we could just back up that wheel a little bit. Okay? But I just thought this was a really good um, comparison of super duper dump truck and more of a unicycle approach. We try and support this guy from the beginning of the slide deck. Um, the reason he was introduced to me is because he had um, overuse injuries and migraines. And you can imagine that, that he had a lot of pain in his neck and his shoulder because of how he set up. If we then alter the configuration of the wheelchair, so we drop his rear seat to floor height. We increase his front seat to floor height. So there we've created that bucket. That's now giving him head over shoulders, over pelvis, over the drive wheels. 
Okay. He's got good access to those wheels. And look at how his posture has improved. Okay. And imagine his pain really went away. Okay. If I go to his before picture and then his after picture. The other thing I didn't mention is we really tightened up his front end. Not only did we improve his posture, improve his access to the wheels, make it all more push efficient, but in terms of in terms of his overall wheelchair footprint, much less, much shorter in the in the after picture as compared to the before picture. Whoops. So he's going to be much more maneuverable around his home, his environments. Okay. You know, I, we talk about how important the frame type is, but boy, I tell you the configuration, how we um, decide where the rear wheels are going to be, front seat height, rear seat height, back angle, it's just as important, okay? So don't just start, stop with the frame, that's only the beginning. And then just in terms of how this stuff adjusts after the fact, really depends on what type of um, chair. We've got some examples here. So this would be an example on um, what we call a fully adjustable rear axle plate. This black thing is what we call an axle plate. And this is on um, a quickie tube, so a folding chair. And this is where the wheel will attach. And I can slide that, I can just loosen off the bolt and slide it forward in the axle plate all the way and anywhere in between. Okay. So this particular axle plate is set up in its most stable position because the rear wheel would be placed here. And obviously this is towards the front of the chair. Okay. You can also change the rear seat height of the chair by changing the location of this axle plate on the frame. So if I wanted to reduce the rear seat height, I would take this plate and move it to these sets of holes. Okay. So all the adjustability available, the Quickie 2 axle plate. If I look at this chair, this is a Quickie 5R, and these rigid axle plates, very similar between the blue one here and the white one, um, this is off of a 7R. You just take these where they're attached to the side rail and on both sides, slide them forward or back. And that's how you would adjust that COG. Remembering that the further forward it is from the front to the back cane, the bigger the number, the tippier, generally the easier it is to push. Okay. And then the rear seat height is also adjustable on these. Um, tricky to see in this particular picture, but you basically remove or add a little spacer that you can see right here. Or on this 5R, you have, this is a highly adjustable rear seat to floor height on the 5R. You can move it anywhere up or down on that axle assembly. Okay. And then we have to think about camber and lateral position as well. So camber is the tilt of the wheels. Um, so basically the bottom of your wheel would be further apart than the top of the wheel. Camber is measured in degrees. The bigger the degree, the more tilt you have in those wheels. Gen just sort of depends on the wheelchair. It either comes in evens or odds, but zero would mean no camber. Two, three degrees would mean a little bit of camber. Three, four, five, six would mean a significant amount of camber. Um, <clears throat> this person in the slide here probably has about four degrees of camber. Camber is really good in providing more laterally, uh, sorry, lateral stability. It also makes the chair turn um, quite a bit faster. It also has less friction with the ground because you have less um, actual the tire hitting the road, right? It also think about it, it follows the biomechanical path of those shoulders. We said at the end of the push phase, you are in external rotation and flexion. Okay, so it's helping with that biomechanical path of the shoulders. 
One thing you do need to consider is that camber does add a fair bit of width to the overall system. Again, depending on the chair, but a general rule of thumb is that for three degrees of camber, you're adding about two inches of overall width to the chair. And that's why we don't put all of our chairs out in sort of 10 degrees camber because nobody would fit through any doorways, okay? But the benefits, especially in a skinny or a pediatric chair in terms of pushing efficiency, lateral stability, turning, you should be putting three degrees of camber, maybe even a little bit more in all of your pediatric chairs. As we become adults, fitting through narrow doorways becomes more important, so we'll tend to have less camber, okay? When you're thinking about camber, you also have to consider the overall lateral access to the camber, uh, lateral aspect of the wheels. You can imagine that as you camber out those wheels, the top part of the wheel will become closer to the frame. So sometimes you need to space out the wheels before you camber them. Okay. Uh, depending on the type of chair, that camber can be adjusted after the fact, or you need new parts. I'll start with, again, this is that quickie to axle plate back here. Um, you can change the camber after the fact with this one. You take um, this axle plate and you can tilt it out, tilt it away from the frame a little bit, just with little washers, build in that little tilt to the axle plate and that's gonna put a tilt or a camber into how the wheel attaches to the frame. Okay. So an axle plate like this, you can change that camber after the fact, with just a couple washers. You can also sleeve out those wheels, so laterally space them so that you have room for the tilt. With a lot of the rigid chairs, this camber bar here is how we um, adjust that or how we determine the amount of camber. And so most of your rigid chairs, you would need to change out a part will add the tilt to the wheels okay, or the camber. The lateral spacing um, is adjustable. So you can just, what we call, sleeve those wheels away from the frame a smidge um, to, to accommodate for that amount of tilt or camber in the wheel. Okay. Um, this is my friend, Charlie. Again, he really benefits from this camber because it gives him that lateral stability. Um, he's outside on uneven trains a fair bit. Um, also helps him with his pushing efficiency. Um, if you look at how low his back is, he's a, like a C7, T1, um, quad really, C7, and he gets away with that sort of low back rest and, and uh, pushing in a manual wheelchair because the chair is so well configured for him. Wheel position, lateral spacing, camber. I think we'll see a picture of him from the side in a moment. Okay. If um, width is important, um, you can really space those wheels in, take away the camber, okay, so that you do have better access to narrower spaces. Just be aware it won't be as laterally um, uh, stable, um, and you're also taking away a little bit of that pushing efficiency that's created by camber. So we've talked about rear wheel position on the frame. We've talked about COG, which is the fore aft. We've talked about sort of the chair's orientation space. So that's front seat height versus rear seat height and back seat to back angle on top of it. We've talked about the lateral spacing. We've talked about the camber. There's a couple other things that we need to consider as well. And that's more about the posture that we're creating through the frame. So where that trunk is in space. With your backrest, please consider the height. Spoke a little bit about that with, with Charlie a minute ago and how short his back height is. Right, the shorter that back is, the more freedom your scapula have to create that scapulohumeral rhythm, right? But if it's not high enough to be stable enough, people will just slouch down and create the stability that they need. 
So consider the height, but also consider the angle, seat to back angle, and also the back angle. Remember that you can create shaping like lumbar sort of um, lordosis or a thoracic extension by either tension adjustable upholstery or by adding a J3 back and adjusting or even a shaped backrest, a J3 PL where it has some shaping on the side or even a more contoured backrest. Okay? If we get that pelvis and that trunk stable, um, we'll be much more proficient at, and, and efficient at pushing that manual chair. Also have to think about the um, lower extremity, lower limb postural stability and location. In rigid chairs, we're gonna call this a front end angle. Um, in folding chairs or swing away, um, chairs that have swing away front ends here, we call these hangers. Okay. We are um, either kind, we're able to select what angle we want it. Most of the chairs, um, we're following the nomenclature that the bigger the number, the closer it is to a, a straight down a 90 degree angle, okay? So this one would be called an 85 degree front end. And then if we made it a 70 degree, it would be longer and more out forward, okay? Things to consider. The tighter this end angle is, the shorter the wheelchair is, the less space it takes, the more maneuverable it is, the easier it is to do a wheelie. But you do need to consider um, how much knee flexion your client has. You also need to consider where they want their feet to be located. Okay? So we're gonna match where that client's lower limbs should be or where they want them to be by a combination of selecting that front end angle and also where the foot plate is on that ankle. Okay. If we have it tucked, sometimes that can happen, that can help with spasticity, can help with all, um, all over maneuverability. Just make sure your client is stable and, and happy there. Same approach if we're using swingaways. This would be more like a 70 degree front end. There. With rigid chairs and some of our swing away front end chairs, we can also narrow the front of the chair. We call this an inset or a taper. What this is really trying to do is capture and hold paralyzed limbs so that they're well supported, they're not moving around, and also just so that we can create a really small front section here. So more maneuverability, better access. Okay. This has a fair bit of what we call inset so that we create a smaller space, capture, hold, secure um, those lower limbs and feet. Do be aware that the more inset that you create, the less space that there might be for big boots, big shoes. So just make sure that you're measuring and know that everything's going to fit well. Um, you also want to avoid any sort of um, pressure over the fibular head there. Just make sure there's plenty of space. All right, we talked a little bit about the overall footprint of the chair. Um, I'll generally measure the, the um, frame length by that back cane to where the front of the hanger ends. And the shorter there, generally speaking, is gonna be more weight over the drive wheels, more efficient push, easier turning, less rolling resistance from your casters. Okay. And also just much more maneuverability in tight spaces, better turning, smaller turning radius. Okay. But again, you have to make sure that the person's going to be well positioned, um, have a good stable posture over the top. We get that frame length by, first of all, your seated depth, the frame depth, by the front end angle, and also by where your wheel is positioned if it has an adjustable COG. 
Okay, all of those are going to affect your overall wheelchair length. And hopefully I've um, you know, made it clear that really optimizing the posture over the top of a given frame is just as important as selecting the appropriate frame. Okay? And for that, we need to think about pelvic stability. We need to think about trunk stability. We need to think about lower limb stability. So all of this is really well supported so that we can get a really nice push on that push rim. Whether we're talking we're a pretty active paraplegic, we're an active but you know tetraplegic, yeah, same approach, or whether we're um, a diplegic person with CP, really wanted to stay with a manual chair because of the freedom, the ease of mobility that gave her, but we wanted to make sure that she was posturally stable and had really good access to the wheels for an efficient push long-term. Okay, you can see she's got really great posture over the top, managing her tone. She actually has quite a bit of high tone, spasticity, and then built in a fair bit of camber to give her that lateral stability and that extra efficiency in her push. The same approach will work with people that are more in the bariatric side or or just have a different center of gravity, right? What I said in the beginning, hasapawa, head over shoulders, over pelvis, over the wheels, axles. With your bigger clients, your bariatric, your amputees, or you know maybe really tall people with big trunks and skinny legs, you're not gonna be able to follow that rule because it'll make the chair too tippy. So very much the point with this young lady here. If we drop her down, head, not even exactly over shoulders, but pretty darn good, shoulders over the pelvis, but then that pelvis is in front of the rear wheels. We had to position these in the rearward position so that she wasn't too tippy backwards. Okay. But we've tried to maximize as much we can her access to the wheels. So she's got a pretty good push forward, and then if she relaxes, she'll get to about 10 o'clock, maybe 10.30. Okay. Remember, it's gotta be that nice balance between stability and maneuverability. Okay. We've dropped her into the, upholst uh, the back upholstery as best we can. Yeah, so we've used tension adjustable upholstery, give her some support at the top, let some extra tissue sneak out the back a little bit, again, to get more access to the wheels and then really positioned her legs so that they're nice and stable, steady, and then a good set of wheels and casters to maximize that pushing efficiency, okay? So the same theory holds, right? Head over shoulders, over pelvis, over the wheels, axles, but then modify it for your body type and also for the wheelchair skill set. Knowing that majority of these chairs, you're gonna be able to tweak where that wheel position is, what the front seat to floor height is, so that we can alter it as their body shape changes, um, as their wheelchair skills change. Uh, this is Charlie again from the side. I told you he's you know, a tetraplegic. He doesn't have any pelvic control, any trunk control. He's missing a fair bit of his anterior um, muscles. But, you know, he sits really well because of how the wheelchair is configured. He's got head over the shoulders, over the pelvis, over the wheels, axles. If you dropped his hand down to the center of the wheel, it would be right there. So a very good, efficient push. And then his amount of dump and squeeze is giving him really nice postural support from gravity. Giving him that stability and then getting him... Um, better access, closer access to those wheels. Uh, two other things we need to consider is um, now our contact with the wheelchair, like how it's being pushed, how the interface works. And then I think we better talk about materials as well. Okay, so we'll start with the contact. And um, um, didn't put tires in here or size of wheels. Realize that the size, the diameter of your rear wheel is going to affect um, your access. So use the same rule of thumb. 
We use a lot of 24 inch wheels because that's sort of standard, it suits most people. But if you have a particularly tall person or um, a tall person where you need a particular seat to floor height, you might consider a 25 inch wheel, even a 26, so that they can get good access to that wheel. Remember the tip of the middle, the tip of the middle finger to the middle of the wheel. Okay. This, this uh, webinar, we're talking about upper extremity propellers. Okay. If we're talking about foot propellers, I might start talking about a 20 or a 22 inch rear wheel or we're dropping somebody low. Okay. But for here, consider 24 or 25, maybe even 26. The bigger the wheel, generally it will roll um, better. It's more efficient, less pushes per distance, but just make sure that you've still given that person good access. Okay. Then when we talk about tires, tires is about maintenance. Um, tires is also about the amount of tread, okay? So figure out where your client is using it and what's gonna happen if they get a flat tire. Are they able to change it, maintain it, get it somewhere where it can be um, switched? If not, can you do a more puncture proof or even a no air tire? Realizing that if we make it puncture resistant or proof or do we do a solid tire, we are adding weight and we are reducing sort of the absorption, the roll friendliness of the tire. When we think about hand rims, um, standard hand rims are your aluminum round, but we're getting much better at thinking about the ergonomics of it. Um, ergonomics are about a different shape. Let me go one more slide. Um, what we'd like to avoid is a real big grip on that hand rim. So we have bigger surface area so we can relax the grip. The minute we have a big grip, we tend to go into extension and that's gonna mess up our median nerve, give us some trouble through their overuse injuries. There's a couple of different um, manufacturers that make these. Um, Natural Fit is probably uh, the most common to us here. It's an oblong um, shape, more fits the palm of my hand. Again, so I can keep that open grip position. Um, Ellipse is a little bit earlier onto the market. It's um, a little bit rounder, more elliptical shaped. But again, the whole theory of both of these is um, open up that wrist, increase the surface area distribution um, during that push. And then we can also add um, thumb portions of it, a thumb connector that'll go in between the rim of the wheel and the hand rim itself. So then now my palm, or the theater, the eminence of my thumb can help and push and keep my, my thumb from closing that grip. There can be different surfaces, a tacky surface or a smooth surface. Um, all of these add just a little bit of weight, so consider that. But Natural Fit again has created a LT version drops about 25% of the, the weight out of the system. And then both of these systems also can add what we call a gription strip, a tacky, um, sticky part where we add friction just to the top of the rim where the person is gonna give the most um, push. So just adding some grip without, a whole, um, without the whole surface needing to be tacky, okay? So those are available on either of these ergonomic versions. Don't forget we would also have a completely plastic coated or a Q-grip. So back to your round hand rims, that's giving a tacky or a stickier surface to the entirety of the hand rim. Okay. Only problem with both of these is that if I'm going downhill and I'm trying to stop, that might be um, adding a lot of friction, some heat, and that can be when some of these natural fits where I can choose what surface I want to be on. But I can have the tacky when I need extra grip, and then I can have a smooth surface when I don't. And then last but not least, what about the material of the frame? Um, more and more materials are becoming commonly available, and I do think um, material does matter, but less about the things perhaps than we think about like weight. Titanium can be just as light as carbon and aluminum can be nearly as light as carbon and titanium. So it's not so much about how much the overall frame weighs because they're so similar, but it's about how they perform. 
and um, how they feel, I think is the, the really important part. So titanium frames, um, titanium as a material does have the highest strength to weight ratio. Um, it's a little bit denser, so then you have to consider that when you're talking about its overall weight. But because it has that really high strength to weight ratio, um, we can have thinner walls because it has that sort of um, strength built in. Okay, so again, when you add it all up, you get a really, really lightweight frame. But I think it's more important to consider about titanium is that it has an absorptive quality. Just how those bonds are created within the metal itself um, has just a little bit more absorption. So that when clients, um, this is a, uh, an octane RGK chair made out of the um, titanium. Um, so when you would be, the client would be driving down with the octane, they would, the frame would absorb more of those uneven surfaces, the little pebbles, maybe glitches in the sidewalks. So it would feel like a smoother ride. Okay? Great for people that have a lot of spasticity, uh, maybe great for people that have back pain, or for people that just want sort of a smoother ride. A consideration in that absorption, we're not a direct transfer of energy. So smidgen of energy loss there. Okay. Again, you just have to say what's most important to my client, what, what suits their posture, their lifestyle, what do they, how do they want to feel in the chair? Okay. And another important consideration within titanium is that it doesn't corrode and it has um, less work fatigue. So if somebody lives right near the sea, right near the ocean, they're spending a lot of time near that seawater, titanium might be a really great option because it's just not going to corrode on them. If we then go to a carbon frame. Um, now carbon has the, the best um, weight, strength, uh, uh, density sort of ratio. Where we see carbon being used a lot is in industry where they need a very, very rigid uh, material and they need a lot of strength. Okay? But it also has to be very lightweight, okay? such as airplanes, bicycles, that sort of thing. We also um, are good with carbon about creating sheets, um, composite structures, okay? because we can mold this and has a really strong unidirectional strength. Um, the great thing about carbon, or the remarkable thing about carbon is that it's really stiff. So it's gonna have a direct translation of the energy. It's super responsive. So the considerations of it is you're gonna feel every bump. It's not gonna be the softer ride that you'll find with the titanium. Okay. It also doesn't corrode, okay, very similar to the titanium. Um, it can fracture, fracture as like a puncture sort of fracture. And that's why you'll see, especially with bicycles, with wheelchair frames, we start to mold and braid fibers so that it has a, um, a tubular strength so that we can have it perform not only in just unidirectional strength requirements, but also multi-directional requirements, which is exactly what a wheelchair does. We're giving it force as it's rolling, we're giving it force down from the weight of the client, we're pushing the wheels, which is giving it another force. Um, this is the Quickie Krypton here in a rigid format. And we actually take all those fibers, those carbon fibers, and braid them into a one-piece tube because we want it to be as strong and um, resistant to damage fractures as aluminum would be, as titanium would be. Okay. So we're getting smarter as all this um, technology happens. Okay. So carbon I'm going to use when I want a direct transfer of energy. I want it to feel super stiff, or my client wants it to feel super stiff. And then aluminum frames, and particularly 7000, 7020 series aluminum, is that in between. It's not quite as absorptive as titanium. It's not quite as stiff. As, as the carbon, but it's that nice mix, okay? It's got a responsive um, ride. It's not quite as responsive as stiff as the carbon, but not as absorptive as the titanium, 
Okay, so that's I'm saying sort of the moderate, the in-between stiffness. Uh, aluminum is actually the lightest of all these materials um, by the amount, by the volume that you're using. Um, but why we think of aluminum as being heavier is because we had to use more of them. So when we start to design the chairs with strength built into the tubing, which is what we've done with the quickie aluminum chairs, we make them with a bigger tubing and an ovalized tubing so that we build the strength into the engineering of the frame design, of the tube design, and then we can have thinner walled to bring the weight down to the other materials, titanium and carbon. Okay. Um, aluminum is also generally less costly because it's easier to weld, it's a more available material when we're comparing it to either the carbon or the titanium. Okay, but when, when you're thinking about these materials and what to uh, sort of advise your clients or, or um, sort of point them in a direction, think about the performance of that material and what might best suit them. Suit their posture, suit their lifestyle, suit their pushing needs. So if we sort of compare them, again, it all comes back to where and how is the user going to use, going to use the wheelchair, the client can use the wheelchair. Talked a little bit about frame design in terms of the tubing, okay, oval versus round, big tubing versus um, skinnier diameter tubing. But we also need to um, consider Consider um, the design, how it's built. Majority of our rigid chairs um, these days are called an open frame or a Z frame. So you'll see that it's just got the one top tube. If you put the backrest up, it's gonna look like a, a Z. That's why I'm called a Z frame. Okay. Open frame adjustable means that it's just gonna have that, that one rail okay? and it's gonna have adjustability within the rear wheel position. So like we looked at before, um, this is a picture of the nitrum. You're going to move the center of gravity just by sliding the axle forward on both sides. And then you can add or remove a spacer for your um, front, sorry, for your rear seat height adjustability, adjustability. And then hard to see here, but in the back, you also have um, not only a fold-down back, which is illustrated here, but you also have seat-to-back angle adjustability. We would also have a Z or open frame fixed. This is going to be for clients that have been using a wheelchair for a long time. They know exactly where they want the rear wheels. They want it to be as light, as durable as possible. So we're going to take away all the adjustability. So it'll either have no rear wheel um, adjustability in terms of where it's positioned or just a little bit, maybe you know, half an inch forward back. Typically, they also have a fixed backrest to reduce the weight, okay? And um, it won't have any seat to back angle adjustability. You'll have to choose that at the time. Now, obviously you can add another backrest, change their back upholstery, that sort of thing. And some of the new versions of the fixed open frames actually do have a fold down backrest. So again, it's just easier to get in and out of a car by yourself. And then we also have closed frame rigids. So now we have an extra tube and either they're called closed or duals. Basically this is increasing its weight capacity and or increasing its rigidity, its durability for heavier duty users. Somebody that's bouncing down um, stairs, somebody that's bouncing down a curb, somebody that's sort of at the higher end of the weight capacity. I'll often recommend, hey, should we close this frame or do a dual frame? Okay. Many of them still have, most of them, still have all the rear wheel adjustability, all the seat back angle adjustability. We're just adding that extra frame. And then in the folders, this is where um, a lot of technology and research development has, has gone into. Um, if somebody just has to have a folding frame, but they really want all the um, pushing aspects, the efficiency aspects of a rigid chair, that's when we'll tend to go to an open frame folder. So you'll see here, this is a picture of the Xenon. It almost looks the same as an open frame rigid, 
except if you look close, it actually has um, a really small cross brace. We've just made the whole cross brace assembly smaller and tucked it into the chair. So it acts, it performs like a rigid chair in terms of its efficiencies, propulsion, but it folds in half. Uh, this one will have all that same adjustability, just looks a little bit different in its design because it's folding. Okay, um, can have all the seat to back angle adjustability. I think one of the really clever things about this chair is it has what we call a auto fold foot plate. So in order to fold this chair, all you have to do is take off the cushion and then grab the seat upholstery and lift up and that front end, the foot plate will fold with it. Because that's sort of tricky for a client to reach all the way down there and fold that up, okay? Pop off the wheels. Um, this one will weigh six kilos transport weight versus um, our Nitrum. This will weigh just under five kilos transport weight. Okay. So very, very similar, just a different design. For somebody that just has to have it fold, but boy, they'd, they'd really like the efficiency of a, a rigid chair. So that's what we call an open frame folder. And then more traditional um, frames in the folding version or um, closed frame, I'll call it both. Basically now, not only do you have that top assembly, but you also have a bottom to the frame. We call this a, a full side frame. Okay. Basically the, the biggest um, positive about these closed frame folders is that it's modular. So it's much easier to change the shape, either width or depth, because it's modular, you can just replace a part. Um, you can also change functionality. If you wanted to turn this thing into a recliner, or if you wanted to um, change your seat to back angle or change its frame length, you can do that with these closed frame folders. Again, just because they're modular, different parts that can be changed out. Okay. Uh, this is a picture of a Quickie 2. Um, Quickie 2 is one of those chairs where we just really want it to always fit. So it comes with that true fit program. In five years that somebody owns it, you can swap out the parts to make it bigger, smaller, because um, we just realize shapes change, people change, situations change. We want the chair to continue to work for them. Um, we looked at that axle plate before, it has all the axle plate adjustability for COG, for rear seat to floor height, all that sort of stuff. Okay. And then um, in more and more of the chairs coming out, the newer chairs, we also can um, choose where we want the front caster arm. You know, before we talked a lot about, about the, um, we want a nice balance between maneuverability and stability. And we really change that by the location of the rear wheels. More and more, especially rigid chairs, we can alter where the caster arm is located. So if we look at this top picture here, we can put the caster arm, this thing, a caster attaches to the frame in a more forward position. Obviously that's gonna make the chair more anteriorly stable. So if people need to reach forward if they um, do a really forward transfer or climb into the chair from the front, that sort of caster arm position is gonna be really advantageous. However, if maybe somebody does a side transfer or into the car and you need, you need access close in the front, well, you might want that caster arm more tucked in. And so then you choose that more rearward caster position, okay? So not only rear wheel position, but also caster position um, can alter how well a chair pushes, um, how well it functions for a client. So don't forget about that being an important decision as well. And then I guess last is um, back to the posture, some, some abilities to build the backrest, a rigid backrest into the frame. Um, on our rigid chair line, this is called a freestyle. So we all know that rigid backrests are better for postural support. We use them when we sit all, all day, every day but sometimes we're less likely to see them in wheelchairs because they add weight. They add something to remove when I need to transport the chair. So this is our approach to really build it into the frame so that it's in there. Works the same as upholstery. The back 
still folds down. You still have height adjustment, you still have angle adjustment, but now you have this rigid backrest for improved back support. Okay. Um, it also really gets those, those back canes out of the way for pushing. So now our arms have freedom to move, to give a really, really good uh, push without any interference, any um, scraping on the arms as it comes through. Hopefully you've um, gained a little bit of knowledge about all the things to consider besides um, size of the frame, depth of the frame, what type of material. There's a lot built into um, how a good wheelchair comes about. Not only the frame, frame material, frame size, but just as important is, is the configuration, how it's put together and what options are included. Any questions, any comments, please shout out. Love to hear from you. Um, appreciate your attendance as always. Talk to you next time. Bye.